Genesis 32 from verse 22 to 32. I'm going to attempt to build on what it was that God began to speak to us last week in spiritual navigation. Um, if you were here last week, uh, I tried to establish to us that the end of the Christian journey is the Father. The Father. And what I was trying to establish by that was to tell us that until you arrive at where there are open disclosures between you and the Father, your Christian journey is incomplete. And this is not something that I produced based on the figment of my imagination. This is a concept that Jesus Christ himself initiated. He said, he said in his word, he said, I go prepare a place for you. So it means that your Christian life has not reached the full consummation of what is possible until you arrive at that place that Jesus has prepared for you. And we're able to see that Jesus was the one that showed us that. That place was not necessarily the place heaven, but the location that is a person who is called the Father. He said, I go to the Father so that where I am, you might be also with the Father. So it is part of your inheritance as a child of God that there is nothing hidden, nothing covered between you and the Father. There are things that are trapped in the realm of God based on our, the sacrificial um, um, atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we are supposed to be able to enter into an experience. But if you don't realize that there is more in God for you to be able to achieve, you will be satisfied with things rather than seeking to be satisfied with a person. And if you were here last week, I said to us that many Christians have grown in their Christian faith with a burning desire for a mansion in heaven. So people are living their Christian faith and they believe that their biggest reward in living a consecrated life in this realm is the fact that they will have a mansion allocated to them in heaven. If that is your expectation, I was trying to say to you last week that your expectation is beggarly because the center of attraction in heaven is not a mansion. The center of attraction in heaven is a person, is the father. Everything that we are doing in this realm is to prepare us for that consummate experience with the father where we will see him as he is. Nothing hidden, nothing covered. And I said to you that heaven is heaven because God is there. Anywhere God is becomes heaven. Heaven is heaven because of the presence of God. And if you are a student of the Bible, you will find that the Bible literally tells us that it is possible to experience heaven on earth. If you were here when we started praying, you would have heard the prayer points that my sister led. That the Bible says that if you love me and you keep my commandments, if you love me, I will come and I will manifest myself unto you. What was God saying? I will step out of the shadows and I will give you a heaven experience in the earth. Because what makes heaven unique is what? The presence of God. So once you begin to enjoy the presence of God and begin to live in the reality of the presence of God, you have begun to experience heaven on earth. There are some of us that when we arrive at heaven, certain things will not be new. It is exactly what we have lived in the visible realm that we are going to continue in the heavenly place. This is why, I don't know how Satan did it, but Satan masterfully entered into the body of Christ and corrupted our definition of worship. 
And because he successfully corrupted our definition of worship, the average believer sings songs but does not worship God. If you've been here long enough, I've told you that you can use a song to worship. You can take certain postures in the natural to worship. There's a word for worship that is called proskunio, which means to bow down. You can bow down when you are singing and you are doing all kinds of things. But that you sing or that you lie down or that you kneel down does, does not necessarily mean that you have worshipped. Your worship begins when you wake up every morning. The time you draw breath, how you live your life on a daily basis is what characterizes your worship. So if you are singing songs on Sunday, but every day of the week you are living for yourself, you are not a worshiper. You are an actor. You are a performer. Anybody can sing songs. I saw a video today where children of the bond woman were inside a building that was called a church. And the kind of prayers we pray in our churches, killing demons and looking for who is troubling us, they had their hijab on. And they could pray those kind of prayer and sing our songs and clap their hands. Anybody can do that. But the Father seeketh true worshippers. And true worship is not a function of a location. True worship is not a function of a song. True worship is a function of spirit connection. So if you will worship God, you will have to worship him in spirit and in reality. Truth. So not everybody that sings a song on Sunday is worshipping God. And that is why we have, we have generated worship programs where we can invite comedians to be part of the procession. The whole idea of that is we think that because we are singing, God is present. Mm, you, you know, I've been around long enough and I may not be a big preacher, but what God gave me from the day I got born of the Holy Ghost is discernment. If you are fake, I know. I mean, I don't need an angel to appear to me in the night. You know, some of you think that there are certain preachers, like one that is called an ambassador, Ubat Angel, that is a man of God, and, and things like that. I know you, you, you listen to certain people, because you have, God gave you money and you bought a decoder. Anybody on that decoder now is a man of God. You can't tell the difference between truth, the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. But God gave it to me, factory fitted. It came with my salvation. I don't need to listen to a man long enough. If I, it's not the, a, a worship meeting is not a successful meeting because a crowd gathered. A worship meeting is a successful meeting because God accepted your worship. And you know when it comes to accepting worship, you are not the one who determines the parameters. The parameters have been determined by a heavenly host. My brother... If Belteshazzar had known that the weighing balances were not a man's balances, he would have been careful how he lived. If he had known that when God wants to weigh men, it is not the same scale that mortal men uses, that a spirit uses to weigh men. He would, on that day that he was excited, he would have put his emotions on that check. But in the heat of his excitement, he went and he drew the vessels from the house of God and decided that he would use consecrated items in the worship of his deity. And then all of a sudden, the balances were brought out. That balance is an immortal balance. You cannot determine the scale. In that balance, you cannot deceive it. You, you, you cannot manipulate the balance. It is, it is regulated, it is calibrated by a spirit. So when that balance was brought out and the measurement had been done in the place that Belteshazzar did not have access to, he said, you have been weighed. And this is the verdict, you have been found wanting. It means that it is not men that measured you, you were measured by a spirit. And when that measurement was concluded, the verdict is what? Found wanting. So worship is not singing. Worship is not dancing. You can dance in worship. You can sing in worship. But your worship begins with how you live on a daily basis. Your worship begins with how you see God 
on a daily basis. Your worship begins with how you engage God on a daily basis. And you may not like me, but 90% of worship is private. True worship will always be born out of the privacy of your experiences. If you don't have that 90% private engagement, the thing you do in public cannot strike a chord in eternity. It's noise. It's noise. True worship is largely private. And don't be angry with me. Just read scriptures. If you just go to the engagement in John chapter 4 between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, you will get, you will get everything that I'm saying. Light will come to your spirit. Very, very clearly. Because the woman began to speak about worship in the context of location. Say, we worship here. You worship there. You say, the Jews say we should worship there. We, the Samaritans, say we should worship here. Then Jesus had to cut in. And first of all, dealt with the matter of location. That this is not a matter of location. First. Then when he had finished talking about the matter of location, he now brought in another perspective. That ye Samaritans worship what you do not know. Because it is possible to say that you are engaging in worship and your, the basis and the foundation of your worship is, is, is driven by a lack of knowledge. You don't know who you worship. In fact, the Bible says that Paul entered into a city in Ephesus and saw a complete statue, an altar to an unknown God. So they were bringing sacrifices. They were engaging in religious rites. But everything they were doing was that they did not even know who they were worshipping. So he said, you worship what you do not know. We claim that salvation is of the Jews and we worship what we know. But both of these things are not even correct. So the lack of knowledge... And the presence of knowledge is not even enough in worship. He says, they that will worship God must connect to a spirit reality. In spirit and in truth.